this afternoon is going to be uh, rather fascinating. I was very lucky to have met Dan Taylor yesterday. Uh, what of Canada's cartoonists to watch? Uh, very happy to have Dan Taylor this afternoon. Beginning her career with countless self-published scenes, that range from office politics to Canadian medical history. Deanna Taylor's first volume of her first full-length full work is now in print as of September of 2013. That is Joel the Super Cow. Uh, volume 2 is forthcoming. And I hope you will enjoy me. Two. Uh, she enlisted in uh, the Canadian forces. There was only two girls in the family and she felt she needed to do her duty and as being the elder sister, she was the one who enlisted. She was uh, dealt in codes, code breakers, code encryptors. So she would be given um, messages and would have to put code on top of them and the message would go somewhere else. She never knew what the messages meant or where they were going to, but that's what she did in the war. And after that, she was Gerald Bull's personal secretary in Valcarche. So I grew, I was very close to my grand aunt and I grew up hearing stories about Gerald Bull and what he did and uh, he was a great boss and a uh, loving person and she knew his family and it was one of the best times of her life. What we know about him, there's been documentaries, BBC documentaries, Fifth Estate, there's actually an HBO movie about him with Frank Langella, uh, is that he was a, a Faustian character who kind of sold his soul by using his ballistics knowledge to help international arms dealers and um, further war efforts. So he's not very well looked upon by Canadian history and it was the contrast of what I heard from my grand aunt and how he's portrayed that I thought uh, there wasn't enough attention to and I wanted to tell what I thought was a story that was more sympathetic and more well-rounded. So, so that's how it started. So this project involved a lot of research 
and uh, I did get a Canada Council grant for it. I did your, your traditional, um, you know, read, read the books about him, uh, requested information from the CBC, has a number of archives of interviews with him uh, through the years, and, and they will burn a DVD for you and send it to you if you know what you're looking for. And it, they have information in French and English. He's, he spoke French and English. I went to the National Archives in Ottawa to look up information on him. I spent a weekend there. It actually wasn't very fruitful because most of the information in the archives is still redacted. So you will take information and most of it is all blacked out. So um, those files are, are still sealed, which is interesting. Um, because of my, I had this bit of a personal connection, I was able to contact his family, who are, his wife is still around, he had a number of kids, they're all in Quebec, and I said, can I come and visit you and talk to you uh, about him? And they were very generous, and I went to Quebec uh, for a weekend, and I stayed with them. What you're looking at here is um, part of the estate. He had quite a large estate in high water Quebec where at a certain time hundreds of scientists worked for him and uh, it, it, was a, it was a real kind of hub of activity in Canada and, and science. If you think about it uh, kind of like the Avro Arrow. Of it, it's, it's that kind of quality of research that was being done. So this is what used to be the guard's house going into the estate. So he had guards there. Now they've turned it into a spot where they rent it out because it's a place where it's very beautiful landscape. You can go uh, cross-country skiing there <laughs> in the winter. So that's where I stayed. Here we go in the um, main part of the house. This is his wife Mimi right here and his younger son, Robert, who is kind of the family um, contact. So if people want to talk to them about Gerald Bull, he's the one who generally does do that. His, this is a picture of Gerald Bull and his wife Mimi in the house. His presence is really alive and really felt. Uh, there's pictures of him all around. They talk about him quite openly. Oh, I should mention he, he was assassinated in 1990. Um, which is uh, a case that is still unsolved. But his family uh, feel very strongly about him, talk about him. He's very much alive in their day-to-day -day life. So this is the outside of the summer home. So the family goes there every summer, and they go there to spend time together. And that's where he lived uh, most of the time. So this is... On the High Water Estate, there was, they were um, building uh, missiles, they were testing, they had garages, they had a gas station, they had, it was a huge area. And all of these buildings are now falling into disrepair. I mean, it's not something that they can, they can keep up, obviously, right? So, um, the main house is maintained by the family, but everything around it is falling apart. And because of his reputation, the people in the area of Quebec were actually quite angry at him. He ended up going bankrupt, and all the people lost their jobs in high water at the Space Research Corporation. And they felt that he was responsible, but he had actually trained people, given them... Um, access to kind of top equipment, paid them really well, tried really hard to keep them employed, but wasn't able to. So now these buildings, there's quite a few of them are vandalized, and people even um, go out and use the buildings as a shooting range. This is Robel Bull, and here's a garage where you see some of the, some of the evidence of what Bull was working on. And here we segue into, so here you can see the building. So I took a lot of photo references um, and the missiles here for the graphic novel. And this is interesting. So after um, 
my grand aunt worked for Gerald Bullows as personal secretary. He had one other secretary after that, who is this woman right here, who is, still works for the family to this day and still keeps the offices, um, helps maintain the estate. So you can see the kind of the loyalty that people have towards him. They have a small library on site of his archives of blueprints, uh, missile designs, uh, kind of models. And so I spent some time in that library and I asked this woman, I said, oh, this is so great. Can I, I, I brought a bunch of documentation. I said, can I photocopy this? Can I take this with me? Can I do this? And she said, no. And I said, well, what do you mean, Mike? I, 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 what can I do here? And she said, you have to understand that you're not the first person who's come here, that people come here over the years, and they say they're going to do a play, and they say they're going to do this, and they're going to work on a film, and then they've taken information, and they don't give it back. So what we have here is what we have here, and it's not leaving the building. So I said, OK. So, um, so what can I do? She said, you can sit there at that table and you can make notes for the next two hours. I said, okay. <laughs> so this, after doing all the, the research, which kind of took a couple of years, um, uh, I had to get into a headspace to understand bull of how he can be um, kind of what I would call a typical Canadian hardworking, uh, patriotic, duty-driven, uh, loves his family, loyal, generous, but at the same time, his expertise is in ballistics. And he was the one whose missiles went the farthest, were the most accurate, um, did the best job. So I had a, a really hard time with that dichotomy so these are um, missile paths, and I found in kind of learning about missiles and doing these kinds of drawings that I could get into a space where um, it becomes quite abstract and almost beautiful. It, and I thought, I think this is the kind of space where he must have lived in in order to do his work. So these are missiles from... Um, the Germans from the 1920s that he studied quite a bit. Uh, just some sketches. So this is Bull here. This is on his wedding day to Mimi. And these, these uh, drawings don't appear in the graphic novel. They're just kind of for my own purposes and trying to understand the character. And just a little bit about process of how I do the comics. So. Right here, not that I'm um, saying I'm as good as Harvey Kurtzman, but Harvey Kurtzman is, is one of the best cartoonists. I uh, worked for Mad Magazine. You can see this panel here is called a classic nine panel grid. And uh, I mean, this is what Car Harvey Kurtzman used. I think it's a good basis. So everything I do is based on a nine panel grid. And if I feel something needs more room, like the top left-hand corner, I'll just break out one of the lines, and then it's a, a larger panel. Uh, I want the story to be the main feature and not the drawing, so I don't feel like I have to be really showy with people kind of going out of the boundaries or people um, having a full splash page. So I think a lot about rhythm and and how to work within those nine panels. So this is just another example. We've got a Watchman page, which is obviously a classic uh, graphic novel. David Gibbons worked on a nine panel grid. It's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Uh, so you can see this panel here. The, the basis is still the nine panel grid, but uh, if something needs more room, then I will do that. For this graphic novel, I wrote it all out in script format. So 
each panel takes me about two hours to draw. So if you multiply that by nine panels, it's, a, it's very labor intensive. So I don't want to waste any work by drawing pages and then having to throw them out, which uh, is a heartbreaking process. So I, I write it out in script form. I actually work with uh, my agent and editor. It took a couple years to get the uh, structure of the book down. I started it out from birth to death, and she said, if you do this, Deanna, it's going to take you 10 years to draw, and nobody cares about the first 25 years of his life, even though you do. And uh, so structured it within Word, and then I actually break it down in panels like this. So um, since I'm drawing it, I don't need a lot of direction to myself. But I'll just say, you know, medium shot, who's talking, is this dialogue? And I go right from here to pencils. And uh, I do a lot of photo reference, so I want to get all the details right. So in the uniforms, uh, those are all very well researched to make sure, okay, is he a general, is he a major, what kind of hat would he wear, what would it look like? So there's a, lo a lot of work and thought that goes into kind of one panel. And if I do use a full page, so there's a few pages in the book where it's a, it's a full page. It's going to be to depict a big gun. <laughs> so uh, this is a big gun from the Germans in the 1920s. It's one of the only full panel pieces. And uh, when I get to part two, which has the super gun, it's funny, I have a friend who five years ago, he says, Deanna, when you do the super gun, that's going to be your two-page spread. And, and uh, the, that will be my two-page spread. So I will break out of the nine-panel grid sometimes when, when I need to. And that's it. Now we're over to questions with Donnie. <laughs> I think that's fascinating, Deanna. Uh, it's, it struck me reading uh, this book and some of your past work, you've... You've also written a, a, a short work on Frederick Banting, um, who we all know. What is it that draws you toward talking about scientists? Uh, so yeah, it's a good question. The, I did a, a story about Frederick Banting for an American anthology. And at the time, you had to do um, a biography of, of anybody you wanted to for the anthology. and. It, since it was an American anthology, I wanted to pick a Canadian, and uh, Banting is in our own back door uh, here in London, and it's another story that, I, when I was reading about Banting, I hadn't realized that his dream was to be a painter, and that he painted with some of the group of seven. And I thought, now there's something, I, we all learn about Banting in high school, and I was kind of angry that I hadn't learned about that. And I thought, well, that is a great story. So that's the story I'm going to tell. Um, and that, again, was a personal connection because my grandfather had um, flown, uh, was a navigator in World War II in something called Ferry Command. And Banting died on a Ferry Command plane, which is something we don't learn about either in high school. Uh, so it was because of my grandpa that I started learning about Ferry Command, then saw the Banting connection at the time that I was asked to do the anthology. So, um, I don't know, I think it's, I'm interested in telling stories that are part of our history that maybe haven't been told in the way I think they should have been. Right. At, at, at points in, in, the, in the bull book and in the Banting story, you, I mean, you're, you're documenting entire lives here, but at, at, at certain points, there's moments where each of them talks about their Canadian identity and how, especially in the case of Bull, uh, could have gone to the States and made a lot more money and had a better career. And in the case of Banning, they say, well, this is a damn fine country we live in here, so here we'll stay. Is that something that you're dealing with uh, with your own work, or is that what, what, what is it about Canadian identity that you, you like dealing with? Um, 
It's true. That is something that's come up and with, with Banting in particular uh, in doing my research that he was duty bound, that his, like I said, his dream, he just wanted to paint. Um, but after discovering insulin uh, before the age of 30, his, the expectations of him were really high. And uh, so when the government said, will you be the chief um, medical officer during World War II, he said, no, I, I guess so, no. Um, and I think that's a very Canadian trait. Um, we are talking to Vincent Lamb last night, and uh, he was talking about how, you know, he's an ER doctor, and he has a full clinical practice, and he writes award-winning books, and uh, he does, he's got three kids, and he's married, and he's trying to make it all work, but I think he's trying to give back in every way he can, and I thought, that is very Canadian. <laughs> um, and it's the same with Bull. So uh, if the government asked him to do something, he would, he would do it. So the Canadian government asked him to work on some projects, and he did it. The Pentagon asked him to work on some projects, which he did, which wasn't good for him. Um, and there, yeah, there's something to that where we'll do, I, I think it's a Canadian thing. We'll do things that are asked of us because it's the right thing to do. You, you also describe a rather fierce animosity toward John Diefenbaker in the book, and yet maintaining a, a staunch Canadian identity and duty throughout that. Yeah, so uh, Gerald Bull hated John Diefenbaker because of what John Diefenbaker did to the Avro Arrow, and uh, he thought he was a fool for doing that, which, you know, his history shows it, it wasn't a good decision. Um, Pierre Trudeau was not a fan of Gerald Bull, um, did not help him out. Uh, our government hasn't been kind to him, and yet he still felt staunchly Canadian. Um, Bull was made an American citizen. The, the Pentagon gave him such a high level of um, knowledge of all of their systems that they realized that was actually illegal and they shouldn't have, they can't have a citizen have access, a foreign citizen have access to that. So they actually made him um, American, which has only been done before with Winston Churchill. Uh, so then he had American citizenship, Canadian citizenship. The Canadian government took his citizenship, wouldn't let him travel with a Canadian passport. And uh, that was a, a huge blow to him that he carried with him for all of his life, actually, that he had to travel with an American a passport. And, and, that, and yet maintained this fervent patriotism that you're well, talking about. Well, after that, after the government treated him badly, he mostly worked out of Belgium, which in Brussels is a, a hub for for international arms. And I think it, it uh, hurt him to come back to Canada when he, he felt he wasn't embraced as a Canadian, but his family was, was there. I, I'm looking at this drawing behind you, uh, and as with every page in your book, um, you can tell if, even if you've, you've not spent a lot of time reading comics, uh, this is an intensely labor-intensive process. There are thousands of lines on this page. Um, it's exhausting when you're telling the, the upside of Gerald Bull's life. Volume one, he, sort of, he, he, he gets along with his education so well. Uh, he founds a, a successful company. He's creating world peace as he goes by developing super guns. And it sort of ends, and I, as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, everything's going well for Gerald Bull. I can't wait to see what happens next. But, of course, it's all going to go in the toilet in volume two. <laughs> yes, that's true. He is assassinated. That did come yeah. up. So, uh, um, so taking this uh, oh, her, like, very, very labor-intensive process, and now you're telling the dark part of the story, does that make it harder? Like each day when you sit down at the drafting table, is it? Are you saying like this is the exhausting part of the story? And now, is, does it make it more difficult to tell the story now? 
I don't think so. I mean, even when I'm doing the early part, I, I know what's coming. I know, I know what happens. Um, it's getting, uh, it's true, book two is kind of the, uh, the ascent, and book, book one is the ascent, and book two is going to be the, the fall. And um, it, the fall is more gray, and I think has um, a lot, even though it happened and started happening in the 70s, is uh, there's a lot of it that all, all those things about international arms and wars and uh, how we deal with those issues are what we're dealing with today. So um, I'm finding a more challenging uh, book two, which I'm working on right now in that way, because it's more live. Um, but it's not, it's not bumming me out. <laughs> um, with, with this story, with, with, with which you have a personal connection, so the, the, the story of the, the, the more monstrous Gerald Bull is not something that is uh, intrinsic to you. You've, you've heard the stories through your, aunt, your great aunt. Um, but even with Frederick Banting, you're sort of telling the unknown history of a very, very well-known uh, public figure. Is there something about the, the unknown story that you find appealing rather than telling the, the history that's already known? Oh, definitely. I think we're done a disservice in, in school about how Canadian history is taught. And uh, I think if we were, we learned kind of all these layers that uh, our history is really interesting. And I think the way it's told to us is very flat and kind of boring. And I think if it were to come alive a bit more with the kind of personal stories that um, we would know our history better. Is there something uh, didactic about this? Like you're, you're, you're teaching as well. Like I, I'm reading this and learning things about aerodynamics and rocket science, literally actually rocket science, or insulin. Are you deliberately trying to teach people about these things, or is it just like is that is that part of the story to like the drawings you showed with the missile trajectories? Yeah, and stuff? yeah. I, well, I think to tell the story, I have to really understand it, and I'm an artist and not a scientist. So, um, but I really like research. I, re I really like it. So learning about insulin was difficult for me. I have to really learn about it, and then I have to draw pictures. And learning about uh, rocket science is totally foreign to me, and is hard for me to get my head around. So how I get my head around it is, is drawing things. But um, I, I like to think that somebody can, will, will learn something interesting. I think if I find it interesting, other people will. And I will try to explain it back how I was able to take it in. You're now on to uh, volume two. You're, it's well on the way. We are anticipating it highly. What do you imagine will be the next Tamlin project, the next would it, will it be something historical, something uh, fantastical, fictional? Well, the, the Gerald Bull book was supposed to be my easy graphic novel That's before I tackled my hard one. Um, and then it turned out to be quite hard. So I have a, a, a big story that I, I would like to tell that's historical Canadiana around Southwest Ontario with the family connection. Um, that's going to be a, a, a big one. So before I do that, I think I'd like to do something light. Um, I had a conversation with Seth recently about um, style. So my style is very tight, and um, I would like to do something more loose and uh, just kind of draft it off. Kate, Kate Beaton who is a great Canadian cartoonist, has a really loose style, and she just can do things really quickly, and I'm quite envious of that. And I think, ah, yeah, I think I'd like to try that. <laughs> and uh, so I'd like to do some kind of loose, fun things before I go back to a tight um, style. And I know Seth was saying, because he was saying something similar, why is, are things he does so... Um, they're really manipulated and, and there's a lot of work to them, which is why he does his sketchbooks kind of in between his kind of more funny ones, Wimbledon Green, before he goes back to Clyde fans. 
So I need to do something fun like Wimbledon Green. Um, I think we're getting at the moment now where we might turn it over to people in the audience. If anybody has any questions. Um, yeah. Question was: Is Bull being rehabilitated in any way? Yeah. It's yeah. That's an interesting question. Um, and talking to the family, the, they don't all go by the last name Bull. I mean, some of the daughters have married. And one of them was telling me that she, she works for the government. She was in the cafeteria. And somebody brought up Gerald Bull. And then there was a heated discussion she overheard where they, they were saying, oh, he got what he deserved. And can you believe that? And she stormed over and said, you know, that was my dad. And how dare you? Um, so I think in Quebec in particular, it's going to be harder for that to come around. But I do know just this past few months, there was an exhibit by High Water of Gerald Bull at a local museum where they had, the, the family put it, helped put on the exhibit, and it was really well attended. And I think this is the, maybe the beginning of relooking at him and, and history, and I, I certainly hope it, it does happen. Some, some of the theories are quite valid, and they should be looked at again. So that maybe yeah, well, Star Wars, he worked on, on Star Wars before it was Star Wars. They were fired from the government. So they, everything he did was from big guns. So when you think of a big gun, when you've got the two, two guys kind of rolling it like that, so that, that's what it was from. They are, they are actually fired from the gun. Everything is gun fired of his um, technology. Yeah, I'll go back to that one because it's interesting. Yep, they're all gun fired. Is so there another question? question? Uh, so, in uh, uh, volume, you're doing volume two. So, in volume two, you uh, explain who assassinated So, um, I am going to try not to push my theory. I, th I want, I'm going to try to just present the facts and let the reader figure, try to figure out who did it. There are some popular theories of, of who assassinated him, the number one being the Mossad. So he was working with Saddam Hussein on a super gun, and people feel that uh, Israel was threatened because of that and that the Mossad assassinated him. Uh, that's generally the accepted theory, but other people think it could be Saddam Hussein. Um, when I talked to the family, they felt it was the FBI. And um, I think that's probably most likely. So I'm kind of planting the seeds for that, and I will try to let the reader pick those up <laughs> and uh, let them form their opinion. Where was he assassinated? So he was assassinated in Brussels, in Belgium, where he lived. He was had been working late and he got dropped off as an apartment building. He was just going in it. He had picked up some groceries. He was opening up the door and someone came behind him and shot him in the head and in the back, five bullets. So that, it, it was a, a professional job. Other questions? Yeah. Um, 
So the question was, do I think about my work being used in schools and do I, I think about that when I'm doing it? So for my, my Banting um, story, the uh, Canadian Diabetes Association approached me to use it as an educational tool. So they have bought like 600 copies from me and um, it uh, regularly sells out at the Banty Museum here in London. So I end up reprinting it quite a bit uh, just for the Banty Museum pretty much um, because they find it's a great tool for kids in particular. So I don't think of it when I'm doing it, but it, it, I know librarians love comics and they love graphic novels for that very reason. So when this is done, I, I hope that it might be used in class. It was on um, uh, Brescia University, taught it as a course um, this fall. When you uh, write your text within the cartoon format, are you using a, a font that's, okay, you're using a font, it's not a, by hand. So when I do my comics, I, I do letter it by hand, oh, but yeah. I don't like my hand lettering, which is weird. So then, but I need to get, the, I need to letter it for the spacing. So then I go, uh, when I take it into Photoshop and I scan it, I had a font of my own lettering created. Oh. And so I use that. And that I also tend to do rewriting when I'm lettering. So even to the last minute, I'm trying to strip words out. Um, so you're saying that you actually did the original font and you yeah. just used that. So it is your handwriting. It's it just is my handwriting. Not, it's that? just a font Clever. of my handwriting. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, I hope you'll, uh, oh. Um, sorry, I can't hear that well, and the actual press one, they, they, uh, repeat something, but, uh, did you go to Concordia? Is that, uh, no, sorry, where did you go to, you went to Concordia? So, yeah, so I, I'm from London, I grew up here, and I went to Concordia for film animation, specifically because I wanted a university degree, and, Film animation was the closest I could get to getting a degree in comics. <laughs> so, uh, which and, and it was really helpful. I mean, I had storyboarding classes, film theory classes, along with studio art classes. So the combination, uh, uh, the, the, I guess my question simply is, what was the most valuable uh, courses for you, putting you in this direction, this combo? What, um, sorry, writing what and, and drawing. Um, if you talk about uh, my schooling, uh, at Concordia, all my professors were NFB professors, so who did um, animated work, and they would support themselves also by teaching at Concordia. So I thought it was a, it was a really great atmosphere, and they also did illustrative work. While I was there, um, two of my professors were nominated for Academy Awards. And um, so it was a really great, vibrant department to be in. And there was one storyboarding class by uh, one of the professors that was so useful in how to break down your stories in a visual manner that um, that that was the class that really helped me and, and informed me in doing my comics. Any other questions for Deanna? Please join me in thinking of Deanna.